The following program is a production of Truth For The World. Thanks for joining us today on Ask the Expert. We have with us today Dan Cates. Dan is an instructor at the Memphis School of Preaching. He graduated from the Memphis School of Preaching in 1994. Uh, he has a master's degree in uh, biblical studies from Ambridge University. Uh, as he teaches at the Memphis School of Preaching, he teaches both English and Greek as well as uh, some other classes. And uh, today we're going to be discussing uh, the English language, specifically something called Bible gramming. Uh, Dan, can you tell us a little bit what you mean by Bible gramming? Certainly. When we teach English at School of Preaching, something that we've recognized over the years is that what helps in understanding what the Bible says is to be able to look at the Bible from the perspective of English grammar and to be able to take those things just as a young person would in a, a classroom setting and diagram what the Bible has to say. And just as you might diagram a very simple uh, sentence to be able to determine its subject and verb and direct object, things of that nature, you can do that with the Bible and you can appreciate very quickly what it is that even someone that writes more difficult uh, sentences like Paul, what he's having to say without much difficulty. Okay, all right. Well, now, as we go through this, you're going to probably realize that uh, I wasn't the greatest English student growing up and even in my college years I wasn't a very good English student so um, diagramming sentences wasn't really a, a strong thing for me so we might need to go a little bit slow but uh, I guess you're equipped to to handle no matter how uh, experienced the student might be right well we, we generally don't jump into the diagramming too quickly okay we do want to cover during uh, this series some of the basics first we want to even go back to some of the first steps and find out what Nouns are and pronouns okay. and all right. adjectives and so forth. All right. Now, nouns, a uh, person, place, and thing. You'll tell us all this right yes. later. All right. Okay, good, good. Well, uh, why don't you go ahead if, uh, if you know what uh, you're going to do. Pretend like I'm your student and just teach me uh, Bible gramming. All right. Well, let's begin with the basic. Let's begin by thinking about nouns. Nouns, as you mentioned, are persons, places, things, or ideas. Or more correctly, they name persons, places, things or ideas. Okay. You can have nouns of various sorts. When we think about a noun, we may think about someone in particular. Let's think about, for instance, a Bible character. We might say Noah. Well, Noah, his name indicates a person, and so that is a noun. Or we may think in a general sense about man. Well, man is likewise a noun. Okay. The difference between those two is that Noah is what we call a proper noun, whereas uh, man is what we call a common noun. The proper noun means a specific one. Okay. Common means a general one. So as we think about uh, Noah and man, we recognize that that's one distinction. We also have a distinction between what is concrete and what is abstract. A concrete noun is a noun which uh, describes something or a word which describes something which can be sensed empirically. That is, it can be touched, it can be tasted, it can be heard, it can be smelled, it can be seen. That's what you mean by empirically. That's what we mean by empirically. With the senses is what that word uh, means. All right. And so that would be something, well, like this board itself, that would be a concrete thing. All right. Or man, as we mentioned earlier. That would be an example of a concrete noun. And that's as opposed to something uh, that would be an abstract noun. Okay. An abstract noun would carry the latter idea. We mentioned purses, persons, places, things, or ideas. Okay. The idea is what would be abstract. Again, if we're thinking in Bible terms, we may think about something like faith as being abstract. Okay. You cannot take a, a test tube 
and fill it with faith and then measure that, uh, that to see how much faith is there and so forth. So okay. faith would be an abstract noun. And then you have what's called a collective noun. A collective noun is a noun which is actually composed of numerous things. For instance, if you think about sheep, you may think about a flock of sheep or, or a herd, perhaps. Okay. Well, flock and herd are both uh, compound nouns. These have more than one entity making them up. So this is, a, this is under collective nouns? Collective, yes. Collective. Okay. I'm sorry, All I said right. compound. All right, so collective nouns, uh, and then we talked about abstract, and then we talked about concrete. That's right. Okay. All right, so uh, concrete is something that you can handle, touch, right. taste, feel. Uh, abstract is uh, something you don't actually get a handle on, per se, something that you think about, an idea, that, like you said. Uh, and then collective is a group of something. Is that what I'm That's right. And we also mentioned proper and common nouns. Okay. Proper, a particular one. Oh, right, right. Common, a general. So proper, like Noah, That's was right. what you said. And then, okay. And then man was general. Okay. All right. All right. All right. We're, we're ready for what's next. Okay. Well, after, uh, after we have nouns, we generally talk about pronouns. Okay. And pronouns are words which can stand in the place of nouns. There are many different types of pronouns. It depends on what they're standing in the place of. We have words which are uh, demonstrative pronouns, words which are relative pronouns, and we'll identify what these are in just a moment. Good. Uh, interrogative pronouns and various ones. These all, in their names, generally tell us something about what they're doing. All right. For instance, when we think about uh, relative pronouns, these are, are relating a person or something else to another part of the sentence. So if we're talking about, again, Noah or man, we may speak concerning that, one, that person as the person who built the ark. Okay. So who would be a relative pronoun. A demonstrative pronoun demonstrates something. Okay. A demonstrative pronoun could be something like that. Well, that ark as opposed to a, another ark. Interrogative pronouns ask questions. Words like what and which are interrogative pronouns. You might say, what is that that Noah built? Well, okay. you're asking a question with the word what. And what there is a pronoun which is standing in the place of a noun. Well, the noun it's standing in the place of is the answer to the question. What is it that Noah built? An ark. Okay. So that pronoun is referring to the answer, ark. So what is, uh, in this case, <clears throat> if, you were to, if you were to put it in a sentence, what would be the pronoun? Uh, and I would say to you, what did Noah build? And <clears throat> when you respond to the ark, you're, you're saying what it was. That's right. I, I'm providing the antecedent for the pronoun. Okay. Every pronoun has to have an antecedent. An antecedent simply is the word to which the pronoun refers, and it's going to either be a noun or another pronoun. Okay. For instance, if we're talking about Noah, and we say Noah is the man who built the ark, then who, as a pronoun, points back to Noah. Okay. And that right. would be tantamount, or that'd be the same thing as saying Noah is the man, Noah built the ark. Oh. Okay. So this pronoun refers to this antecedent. Now I want to clarify something which uh, some have heard along the way, and generally it's the rule. That is that a pronoun refers to its nearest antecedent. Okay. And that's not always the case because an antecedent can be any noun or pronoun. And sometimes that just does not make any sense whatsoever. Like what? For instance, in Acts chapter, uh, in Acts chapter 2, mm -hmm. we see that uh, there is the use at the beginning of the chapter of the word they. Okay. And this has to do with those who were present on the day of Pentecost on whom the Holy Spirit fell. Many people will say that the they there was everyone in Jerusalem okay. and not 
uh, the limited group of apostles. But in Acts 2, 1, we read, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now that word, they, could refer to a number of things inside that sentence. Well, what are the nouns which precede they? Well, we see Pentecost. Could the, de- to, could the they be referring to Pentecost? Well, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, Pentecosts were all with one accord. No. no. <laughs> right. And so that would violate the idea that the noun refers to the nearest antecedent. Okay. All right, okay. And even the one before that wouldn't work, and that is day. The right. days were all with one accord right. in one place. So we need to keep looking for that. Now what some in the religious world will do is they will look the wrong direction for the antecedent. Generally speaking, an antecedent precedes the word, the pronoun, which okay. is being used to rename it. And they will look to all those that were present uh, in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and say, those are the they. Well, to do that, they have to go down to verse 5 oh. of chapter 2, where we read, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews. Okay. So who could this they be in verse 1? have to keep going backward. have to keep going backward. Okay. Okay. We need to remember that in the original, the, when the Bible was being written, there were no chapter and verse subdivisions. Okay. And so chapter 1 and chapter 2 flowed right together. So we see in chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord. That carries us back into the former chapter right. to find out who the they is. Well, the nearest uh, word is apostles. And indeed, okay. these were the apostles who were the ones who were with one accord okay. in one place. So if I can just stop you a second so I can get this. <clears throat> so what you're saying is um, your pronoun, if I can just steal yes, this sir. and write on this, your, your pronoun here that we're talking about is the word they, correct? That's right. And if we're going to try to find its nearest antecedent, we have to look, uh, if, correct me if I'm wrong, we look backwards and not forwards. That's right. The exception would be in the sense of the question that we asked. Oh. Uh, the question, what did Noah build? Oh, he I built see. an ark. And well, so the then, ark then would be. Okay. But generally speaking, you're going to be going backward, not forward. Okay. And so the way that, that we would, ru- ru- would word that is not the pronoun refers to the nearest antecedent, but the pronoun refers to the nearest reasonable uh, antecedent. Okay. And we notice that right. uh, Pentecost, Pentecost and day, be, yeah. right. those were not reasonable. Okay. And it also wasn't reasonable to look four verses in the future. Right. So right. we look backward and find the nearest reasonable antecedent, which in Acts one twenty six is apostles. And indeed, the apostles are being spoken of uh, throughout that set of verses. Okay, okay, good. Well, I think I got that. So, <clears throat> so pronouns, uh, I guess, modify is the word. Right, they or they uh, look back to really the noun. really renames, renames renames the word. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that that pronouns cannot modify. Okay. Because they can. For instance, if you have a possessive pronoun, uh-huh. you might say, uh, "Whose ark was that?" Okay. And we might say Noah's ark, or we might say his. Arc. So what is the difference then, um, because as you well, I don't, my English is failing me, but what, what is the difference between um, renaming and actually uh, modifying? What would be the difference? Okay. Well, if you're renaming something, y- you are stating it in a different way. If you're modifying it, then what you're doing is describing it. Okay. And, and you're indicating some attribute which it possesses. Okay. And right. so if, if we think about, uh, for instance, Noah and who, let's say that we're, we're so, or Noah and he, if we have he mm-hmm. and we have Noah, this is not giving us more detail about Noah. It's simply renaming okay. Noah. Okay. Whereas if we're talking about the ark, then we're describing the ark as his ark. Well, his, regarding the ark, tells us more about the ark. It tells us that it is Noah's ark. 
That indicates that it is no one but Noah's okay. All right. ark. And so that would be the basic difference between renaming something and modifying, and modifying something. Okay. Although when you are using pronouns, those could really at times serve either purpose. Okay. And some of the other words could as well. All right. All right. Well, why don't I erase this and then we, we can move on as you, uh, as you feel like I can handle. All right. Okay, we, we've seen the basic nouns and pronouns. Now, words which modify nouns and pronouns are words called adjectives. Okay. An adjective, generally speaking, will tell which one, what kind, or how many. Okay. For instance, if we were describing the ark, we could describe it as Noah's ark. That tells us which one. Uh -huh. We know that there was one ark built by Noah. That tells us how many. Okay. And we remember that the ark was made out of gopher wood. And that tells us what kind. We might say it was a gopher wood ark. Okay. So that's what kind. Which one, what kind, how many. If we're looking in Hebrews chapter 11, we find some great examples of uh, adjectives in that particular chapter, as well as some of the other things that we've been discussing. I might mention in Hebrews 11 just a couple of the verses which are found uh, therein. Let's look at verse 7 regarding Noah. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an, an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Now we don't necessarily see any colors telling what kind or any numbers telling how many. However, we do see some adjectives in that particular verse. We see that he was moved with fear and he prepared an ark. Well, what type of ark was it? It was an ark. This is what we call an article, but an article is an adjective. The three articles are a, an, and the. All right. What a, an, and the do is they identify whether something is a particular one or whether there are many of something. All right. Now, he built an ark. And we mentioned a minute ago there was one ark. However, there were other things in Scripture called arks. You may remember the Ark of the Covenant. Right. Uh, Moses was placed by his mother in an ark of bulrushes. So he built an ark in a general sense. But we could speak specifically about Noah's ark and say the ark. Okay. And it would, that would limit it to one. So if it had just said... He built the ark, that would have been <clears throat> then what Moses was put in was maybe something different from uh, That's right. it, his specific ark. His was right? another kind of ark. Okay. And so it could say uh, Moses built the ark of gopher wood. Okay. Or something along that line. Okay. And that's the difference between what we call a definite article and an indefinite article. A definite article defines one, the. And an indefinite article is used for any, a or an. Okay. If we look further into that verse, we do see the definite article coming into play. Prepared an ark uh, to the, the saving of his house. Which saving? The saving. Okay. So there we have the definite article. A very specific. Very specific. And we also see... By the which, okay, in that manner, there was only one way by the which he condemned the world, the one world, and became heir of the righteousness. There was one righteousness, which is by faith. So we see several of these articles right. used in that verse. But we also see in that verse a pronoun being used as an adjective, that's the pronoun his. He was preparing this ark to the saving of his house. He was not preparing this ark to the saving of his neighbor's house. 
He was not preparing this ark to the saving of some stranger's house. He was preparing this ark to the saving of his house. No other house would be saved by that ark. Well, now, if <clears throat> so that I can understand maybe what you're saying is, uh, because w when I've read the story of Noah, you know, we, we've often heard it said he was supposed to save the world with his ark, right? So you're not, you're not actually just saying everyone should have built an ark. He was only responsible for his house, right? Is that what you're saying? Or well, his house came into the ark. Right. We know that others had the option to be able to go with Noah. He preached to them for a great period. Okay. Trying to warn them concerning the, uh, concerning the devastation okay. which was to come. And yet they ignored that warning. So it ultimately was to the saving of uh, his house. So writing uh, retrospectively after the flood, he could then say it was only for the saving of his house because that's all that would obey, right? Is that's that all that obeyed. Okay. Now, did others have the opportunity? Sure they okay. did. All right. But that helps us to appreciate that there is one location of the saved. In, in Noah's day, if you were not in the ark, you were not saved. Right. Who was in the ark? His house. Today, there is a location of the saved. The Bible speaks concerning one church. Right. Well, one location has often been the place of salvation in Scripture. We see that in Noah's case. We see that in the New Testament. During the days of the plagues, you right. may remember that the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, that death of the firstborn took place on any house which was not marked by the sign of the blood on the doorposts and the top of the door. Okay. So there was a location and so of I salvation. Guess, I guess later as we get through and do some more of this um, Bible gramming, I, I guess we will see a little more clearly uh, some of these things, uh, like you said, just like Noah's Ark was the only place salvation was offered at that point in time. Uh, today you just said that the church is the only place salvation. And I guess we'll see some of those verses We will see later. some of those verses. Okay. All right. Certainly will. But there we have the, the nouns, pronouns, and the adjectives and how they relate to each other. Now those, we, we might sort of loop into one category just that those have to do with things and describing things. Then we get into another category, and that is the category of verbs. Now, you may remember that verbs are things which are either actions, uh -huh. they show action, or the things which show state of being. For instance, Noah built an ark. Right. But we think about uh, Noah... He was the builder. Well, built is an action. Was is simply showing the state of being. Okay. He was, what was his state? He was the builder. When we think about verbs, we also recognize that they can serve uh, to help to complete a thought with another verb. We call those helping verbs. For instance, as he was building the ark, he was building it. Was and building are both verbs. Building is your action verb. Okay. And was is what we call a helping verb, helping to complete that action. And as we go further into this series, we're going to see how the verbs relate to not only each other and in a helping sense, but we're also going to see what the verbs can tell us regarding either who the subject is or what the subject is, or what's being accomplished by the subject. As we go further, we're going to see that the action verbs can take objects. What this means is the action verbs can show that something is being done to something else. The linking verbs are going to describe the subject, as right. we mentioned so earlier. So I'm, I'm getting a little bit uh, lost, maybe. I'm uh, having a difficult time. All right, so walk me through a sentence where each one of those, and maybe that will help me, uh, where each one of those are used so that I can get it better in my mind. Okay. Feel my. Let's think about, again, using the illustration of Noah and an action verb. Noah built. 
Okay. Now there's an action. There, there's the action. Clearly, he, he did is performing something. an action. Right. Okay. And what action is he performing? He's building. building, putting something together. Okay. And that begs the question: What? What is he building? Mm-hmm. Well, an action verb is going to beg that question. Okay. And so the answer to that question is ark. Noah built ark. Right. So the verb helps to tell us what the subject is doing. Okay. We could say in, in the other example that we used, Noah is, uh, build, is the builder, okay. or Noah was the builder. In that case, the verb helps to describe Noah. Okay. It links Noah to a descriptive term. So even though the word builder seems to be an action uh, because it's what he did, he, that's really not the verb. Of that's, not, that's not the verb. Okay. You can build something, but you can't build her something. Okay. All and right. we're going to see a, a number of times uh, in, a, in a short while in these, this series uh, how verbs can be used as other parts of speech. Okay. But in this particular case, builder is just describing Noah. Okay. If you were to ask, who was the builder? Then the answer to the question would be no. Noah. Okay. And the point with regard to the verbs is that verb helps to describe that relationship. Okay. Well, we certainly have learned quite a bit today. Uh, I've been a little bit confused at times and uh, somewhat even uh, maybe overwhelmed here and there, but uh, we're certainly appreciative, and I know I look forward to hearing more about uh, Bible gramming and uh, getting into some of these verses. We're going to talk a little bit more, from what I understand, and talking with uh, Dan, we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the more controversial uh, scriptures, some of the things that perhaps you've wondered about, you've questioned with your friends, maybe even just questioned as you've studied your Bible, some things that uh, uh, will help you to understand the English Bible. Again, you don't have to be a, a Greek scholar. You don't have to know the original language. Of course, uh, it, w- it would be helpful. But uh, as, D- as Dan earlier said, if you have a working knowledge of the English language, then you have everything you need to understand your Bible. And uh, that's why we're doing this, to help uh, me get smarter about uh, studying the Word of God and to help you as well. And so uh, we thank you for joining us today on Ask the Expert. We thank Dan, and we look forward to more lessons from him. If you would like to learn more about God's Word with a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth For The World, P.O. Box 5048, Duluth, Georgia, 30096, the United States of America, or visit us online at tftw.org. The preceding program was a production of Truth For The World, a work of the Duluth Church of Christ.